welcome to um, our event today that um, we are doing in conjunction with, uh, with Castor. And uh, today's focus is going to be around how CAD file analysis can automate the identification of parts for additive manufacturing. Uh, my name is Michael Petch, and I'm the Editor-in-Chief of the 3D Printing Industry. So I'd like to welcome our two guests today, who are Omar Blair, who is the co-founder and CEO of Castor, and Werner Sappler, who is the Global Head of Additive Design and Manufacturing at Danfoss. Gentlemen, please can you turn your cameras on? Hello, Werner. Good to see you. Hello, Michael. Good Hi, Michael. Hello. Thanks Hello. for the time and the opportunity. How are you, Werner? I'm well, yourself. Excellent. Well, we are we are live and we are rolling, and I can see the uh, the rooms are filling up. So, um, perhaps maybe just to acclimatize our audience and just to um, familiarize themselves with um, with your both your companies. Emma, perhaps you could tell us briefly about some. Um, who you are and what Castle does, please. Sure, thanks. So uh, as presented, I'm Omen, I'm the CEO of the company. We're called Castor. We will present us in a second. Um, I used to work for Stratasys for a lot of years. In my background, I'm a mechanical engineer, and I also hold an MBA in entrepreneurship and innovation. They both from Tel Aviv University. This is where we sit. We're sitting inside Tel Aviv University. It's one of the company's investors. Um, we uh, founded the company back in 2017 with the goal to help manufacturers to realize the full potential of additive manufacturing, and I'd love to elaborate on that down the road. And thanks. Thanks for the time and the opportunity today. Excellent. Looking to learn a lot more about Castor in a moment. Um, Werner, people will be familiar with Danfoss, no doubt, but perhaps for those who um, who have been living under a rock, maybe you, know, you could mention a little bit about the company, please. Yeah, sure. Uh, we're we're uh, I, I guess you could call us a largish, medium-sized uh, industrial conglomerate uh, divided into three business segments. What we call Danfoss Climate Solutions, Dan Danfoss uh, Power Solutions, and Danfoss Drives. And I hope those names are descriptive enough to describe the product categories that they entail. Uh, we do around $7 billion uh, revenue internationally. We're all over the world. We have uh, upwards of 70 factories. Uh, my role at the company, as you've already mentioned, is Global Head of Additive Design and Manufacturing, meaning uh, my responsibility and my team's responsibility to implement additive manufacturing within the group. Marvellous. Right. Well, without further ado, um, let's kick off um, the first topic, which is the challenges and opportunities of additive manufacturing. Now, a report by the consultancy firm Deloitte um, entitled The Challenges of Additive Manufacturing identified the fact that despite the potential for AM, many organisations have not expanded the role of additive since its inception in the mid 80s. Um, I'm wondering why that is and what are the main challenges? Werner, what's your, what are your thoughts about this, please? Well, I think there are a few reasons, um, and these not necessarily in order of importance, but as I see them, I think the AM industry has had difficulty transitioning uh, from where their roots and the bulk of their business lay in the past, namely prototyping, uh, to the manufacturer of end, to the manufacturer of end components. And I think one of the reasons for that is that they've laid a lot of uh, emphasis on technology, uh, but they've had very little uh, uh, or insufficient look at the structure of, uh, of the industries that they're trying to serve. So what do these companies look like? How do they operate in procurement? What are their expectations of a manufacturing system as opposed to a prototyping system? And I think the the industry OEMs have tended to follow uh, that narrative. And so they've got kind of forever stuck in prototyping and tooling. Uh, and with the exception of some notable uh, industries uh, like aerospace and medical, simply haven't been able to make the transition. And then the other points are, of course, costs need to come down further, I think both for machines uh, and materials and the entire process chain. 
And last but not least, um, it's a mindset issue as well. A lot more training, I think, needs to take place. And that started happening, but only in the last year or two at the schools, at the universities, particularly in educations like that, that Omar enjoyed, you would have, you would expect the universities to put out students these days um, who come with some of those skills at least. Mm -hmm. I think we're going to definitely get back to some of those issues, in particular the costs a bit later on, but some, Omar, what is, what's your take on this Deloitte report? Um, I think Werner uh, touched the, the, the important stuff. The way we grasp the status of the industry is that uh, it's mainly the lack of information and in-house expertise that mm. prevents company to utilize 3D printing to generate profits. When I, what I mean by that it, is that we see uh, OEM companies that owns a hardware product. Uh, they do uh, designs, they do marketing. They, most of the times they, they shift the blueprints to a third party manufacturer. And none of the sides consider 3D printing as an option to reduce costs when it comes to low volumes. And, and that's an interesting point where we are in Castor, in the software, we're trying to help them to see the pros and cons to consider 3D printing as an option to reduce cost. And, and, and I think it's, it's a barrier that they need to, to cross to adopt additive manufacturing. Well, let's get into some of those pros and cons and, and what potential does uh, additive here have here to revolutionize design and manufacturing processes plus of course enhancing functionality in parts and products interested to hear your thoughts about that Werner please well um again i i think uh, i referred to the costs earlier on and and Irma has just built on that a little bit um, and it's true, uh, we are disinclined to look at additive manufacturing today uh, with the costs being where they are today as a cost saving device. We're much more inclined to look at it as a method of, of adding sufficient value to justify uh, the increased price over conventional systems. And then of course, and again, I exclude the aerospace and the medical industry. Um, and I think what needs to happen is, uh, and we've started doing that inside of Danfoss, you need to start building uh, the necessity for additive manufacturing or for considering additive manufacturing into new product development processes. And when I say build it in, I mean structurally and as part of fact facts or whatever methodology uh, companies like ours use. So that's the new product development side of it. And then of course, where particularly Costa comes into its right is you need to scan your existing uh, spectrum of leg legacy parts for high potentials, both from the perspective of adding value and from what Omer added a while a moment ago, um, reducing costs and that's one of the reasons why we're adopting the the um, software as well we have upwards of a million part numbers it's impossible to do that on a on a manual basis or on a uh, even with a small uh, team to try and and cover that number of part numbers without decent software to do the job yeah, I think we're going to come back to some of that. Um, you alluded to design for additive manufacturing there, but I'd definitely like to hear your take on this as well, Omer, please. Um, so us as, as a startup company, we're trying to run from trying to educate engineers to think 3D printing when they start to design. That's a hard task to do. That's, that's the, the large 3D printing company's task. So what we're trying to do is to to show the benefits by utilizing the design as is. And with that, we're doing some interesting stuff. For example, to identify opportunities for parts consolidation and to identify opportunities for weight reduction. So mm. parts consolidation is, is a very unique algorithm that we have that identify adjacent parts out of large assemblies that makes sense to be combined to a single part. And as a single part, 
they are cheaper than the traditional manufacturing method. And, and weight reduction, I mean, most of us know that it is a, a big ticket of additive manufacturing. Uh, in, in one of its advantages, we are trying to identify bulky parts that make sense to use additive uh, uh, to make them hollow. You can actually use the software to make hollow parts. And these are the two advantages other than cost that we're trying to reflect to, to our users. Okay, great. So, well, anyway, if I'm correct, Danfoss have been using AM for um, at least five years now. I'm interested to know a bit more about um, what the internal knowledge was like at the company in tw uh, 2016 when you started on your journey and what, um, what were you actually looking to resolve there? Yeah, so Michael, we didn't actually start with additive manufacturing. Well, uh, uh, it's a matter of debate. We've been doing 3D printing, if you like, uh, um, and if we can um, use either of those terms, but we've been using 3D printing for prototyping for a long time prior to, to 2016. Um, but that was, as I say, mostly in, in prototyping. So one could almost say that the AM journey from the additive manufacturing perspective started in 2016. So what we did fairly early on is we formulated a concrete uh, strategy. Uh, and what we did is we differentiated between prototyping, tooling and end component manufacture. We viewed them as three totally separate um, application areas and the reasons were simple we as i say we've been doing prototyping for many years so we our starting point was a different one our state of knowledge in those three application areas was a different one and then we started changing the mindset uh in those three and particularly with a view to the last one the end component manufacturer because that's where we believe the future believed then and believe now that the future lies. So that involved training, training, and more training. Mm -hmm. uh, the deploying of the tools that were available then and that are available now. So hardware, software, and training. And software has come a long way, of course, since then. Uh, not just uh, software like casters, but also stuff like generative design and what have you to enhance the use of additive manufacturing in those three in those three uh, application areas and the pain points for those three application areas of course differed so we are still going through a lot of the pain points now particularly when it comes to supply chain uh, when you're ordering prototypes in a company like ours you can usually um, order them pretty much anywhere when you're ordering end components that are going to build, be built into a compressor or into an hydraulic motor or something like that, it's an entirely different qualifying process, but it's also an entirely different procurement process. So try telling the procurement part, department that for the last 15 years has been trying to reduce the number of suppliers, uh, both in numbers and in size, that they should now onboard new suppliers that are relatively small mm. or relatively small volume. That's one of the structural issues that I referred to earlier as well. Okay, I, I see. So, um, look, we've got um, we've got a first question coming, which I think I can answer this one about. Um, will we be running demos of the Castor software? Absolutely, there will be demos coming up. Um, we're going to, going to get a brief taste of what the software looks like in this session, and there will be much larger demos in the networking. So please do stay on for that. Um, we do um, we do also ask if you want others ask questions, please do send them in the Q and A. Um, I've got a question here though for uh, for you both. Are there any specific industry sectors that are more advanced in the adoption of uh, industrial three D printing compared to others? Omar, perhaps you could uh, give us your thoughts first, please. I can answer from Castor perspective, mm -hmm. uh, and we do have uh, some Fortune 500 companies as, as customers. We It's obvious that automotive and, and aerospace and medical devices are leading the world of adapting additive. But what we see, and, and I think it's interesting to, to see, is that the machinery industry, 
and, uh, machine, and, and industrial equipment companies or even oil and gas or energy companies that maybe the, the level of uh, critical mission parts is a, list, a, a little uh, less important or, or I would say it, otherwise the need for certification might be um, a little uh, less needed. So in those areas where there are peripheral parts, a lot of tools, jigs and fixtures, we see we see some large, uh, nice opportunities. So um, I, I do think that industrial machinery is a good area to look at. To look at. Well, does that chime with your experience? Yeah, so I'd already mentioned uh, um, what Omar just touched on um, aerospace and medical. The business cases there are very obvious for the end components. They're not as obvious in our industries, uh, for instance. Um, but we we are starting to see, and it and it certainly helps that that um, there is software like this now that is focusing on the cost part as well. We're starting to see, you know, we're we're by now at a stage where we're manufacturing in series around 25 end components uh, inside Danfoss. That's mm -hmm. not a lot if you consider what I said earlier on about the number of part numbers that we have, but it's not a bad start either. And we're starting to see processes, and here's where the cost becomes important, where a uh, part is actually not designed for additive. Uh, we do the ramp up production uh, in, we, we, we do dual qualification for both printing and let's say injection molding as an example, do the ramp up production and that may be two or two and a half years uh, additively, then mm -hmm. switch to injection molding when the volumes justify it. And then at the end of the product life cycle, with, which with us can be 40 or 50 years later, uh, we can go back to additive manufacturing without requalifying. Hmm. Okay. Well, look, let's talk a bit about um, maybe accelerating the adoption here. And um, in particular, the next topic we're going to look at is finding the right parts for uh, AM. Um, so here, yeah, how and when do companies um, currently identify parts suitable for additive manufacturing from a business perspective and then from a a technical perspective. I think, Omar, you'll probably work very well placed to answer that one, please. Um, so so that, uh, that's exactly what we're trying to do with the software, we're trying to automate the manual process that experts are doing today when they're trying to identify the right parts for additive manufacturing. And we're doing that based on CAD files analysis, computer aided design uh, files analysis. And, and we're doing that both technically and economically. Uh, the main pillars that we are looking at, um, and, and when I'm saying that, uh, we know how to look at a lot of parts at once. I mean, the big advantage of using software to do what a manual process is sometimes uh, lacking is to analyze thousands of parts at once. And so we know how to take large assemblies, large bill of materials, or large inventories list of individual parts. And in the technical aspects, we're, we're relying on, on two pillars, materials and geometry, which means what is the best match materials properties that matches the traditional manufacturing materials properties in the light of the preference of the user of, of, the, of the right material properties that he, that he thinks that are preferred, which means that if you are very sensitive to strengths or very sensitive to cost, you might get two different um, answers. Okay, I'll, I'll, maybe I'll share an example about that in, in a second. Yes, yes. Um, um, I mean, it might be a, a good opportunity to do it now. I think that, uh, um, let, me, let me, you see it, then I can. Uh, here we go. Yes, I can see that. Yeah. So talk, talk us through what we're looking at here. Yeah, so uh, what we see is, is a slide that represents an example from one of our customers, Stanley Black & Decker, a big company in, in, in the US. It's in, in Danbury, Connecticut. It's a metal part that we've identified out of a large machine that makes helicoils. Uh, so Stanley had a cost reduction initiative. They uploaded a few sub-assemblies of those uh, helicoils, and uh, um, we've identified a few parts, and this specific part was delivered in nine days versus nine weeks, and also saved 
50% of its traditional manufacturing costs. Um, just by identifying this opportunity out of a lot of parts they make using our software. But the point that I want to make is that this part was traditionally designed for tool steel, and we in the algorithm recommended to use margin steel. And uh, it might have a it might be less strong. The ultimate tensile strength of margin steel might be much less than tool steel, but Stanley cared about hardness, and in that aspect, margin still is addressing the need. And when you're trying to show the user the compromises on the mechanical properties versus the advantage that they get on the delivery time or on the cost reduction, you sometimes uh, find that maybe the original requirements weren't really needed. Mm -hmm. um, so. So that's on the material side. We're also doing geometry checks to check if the, the printer can actually print the part. Then we're doing an economic check that we will talk about it later of what is the break even point versus traditional manufacturing method. And uh, eventually we do a stress analysis based on finite elements analysis to check the likelihood to failure of the part based on the external forces detecting our part. So I think those four pillars are the main the key aspects, materials, geometry, financials, and the stress analysis, simulation analysis of what is, of what the part will behave in the real life to, to identify a right part for additive. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's that's a very far explanation. And you touched there also on um, uh, alluding to the volume of uh, parts you've been looking at. How many files has Castor analyzed to date? And have you learned anything or gained any insights from looking at that, uh, that volume of part? components um i can say that that we looked at uh 30, parts over the last year um about the statistics that were that we've identified is that about 70 percent of those parts are not suitable for additive as is about 20 percent of those parts make sense to use additive with some changes either geometry changes or or material changes or um, uh, files, CAD files issues, mm -hmm. and 10% of those parts make sense to use additive as is. About half of those, meaning 5%, are being sent to quotes. So about 5% are really interesting from a technical and from economical perspective from 30,000 parts we've analyzed this year. Okay. So, uh, right. Um, Okay, let's uh, let's take a few more questions. I think um, so. Let's have a look. What have we got here? Um, the question in the, the Q and A, which says, uh, "How do we manage the challenge of data access and availability when looking to make decisions for AM? And how does Castor account for this challenge?" Um, can you repeat the question? Sorry. Yeah, sure. It's about data access. So, how do you, mm. how how do you manage the challenge of data access and availability to um, around these decisions for AM? And how do you account? How does Castor uh, deal with that challenge? Yeah. So, uh, I would say first, uh, there are twenty things to be solved in additive manufacturing. Uh, a lot of them has to do with software. We're solving the first one which is what parts make sense and what small changes you might want to consider to utilize the benefits of additive manufacturing so uh there are solutions out there for uh handling the data and 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 doing a lot of interesting stuff with the parts that make sense send it to service bureau order management uh keeping the file security etc cetera, etc cetera. um we're very good in connecting between the thoughts and being this first uh um very first pointer, which means we know how to take data from uh, PLM ERP systems, okay, and push it downstream to workflow uh, software. And, and I think in that perspective, uh, we're, we're, we're providing a solution that everybody needs. Okay, excellent. Um, it looks like we have another question coming in. Uh, this one's for you, Werner. Um, uh, Baz asks, is the information about parts up to date in PLMs, PLM systems so it is possible to automatically identify the parts or as much manual labor and analysis required to find the right parts 
Well, I think that's kind of the flip side of the of the coin of to the question that that Omar's just answered. Um, but certainly in a company like ours, I wish I could sit here and say, yes, it's all perfectly well ordered. We know exactly where to find which file and which ERP uh, corresponding ERP uh, data. No, it's not. Uh, but certainly that's what the software is helping us to do. And we do have do we do have to do a certain amount of structuring, but it's a minimal amount of manual labor. Mm -hmm. We're also um, uh, I, I have the unfortunate I'm in the unfortunate position that I have an economics background. I know nothing about engineering and I work in a company with some of the best engineers in the world. So that can be uh, difficult sometimes. Uh, but it does mean that I'm an 80 percenter, and if if we can cover 80 percent of our parts, that's a given the numbers mm -hmm. that I mentioned earlier on. That's a big chunk, um, and even if then there needs to be some manual labor, if Costa can narrow down uh, from 100 to 10 uh, the 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 number of viable parts or from 1,000 to 50 or something uh, of that nature that we could potentially deal with manually and stuff like redesign and what have you that there needs to happen, that we that we have expertise in-house. It's not that we don't have ex mm -hmm. expertise in-house. It's just not uh, sufficient expertise and it's not going to be for a few years to cover the number of, of part numbers that we have. I hope that answers your question, Baz. Um, I've got a question for you, Emma, which is how can companies evolve from looking at the low-hanging fruit opportunities for additive manufacturing to more sexy parts or mission-critical components? You know, those uh, those fuel nozzles that's a poster child of AM, things like that. Right. I think we mentioned that earlier that that we in Castle we rather look at the non-sexy Mm. part just just because we think the opportunity there is is larger although m maybe the savings pair part might be a little less saving but the overall opportunity to identify such parts uh, might be on the non-sexy uh, area of manufacturing um, uh, uh, your question relates to the uh, solutions that Castor has to offer we do have a software that identifies parts from an existing design as is and that's for your question we also have um, a software tier that is Castor Enterprise, and that's to identify not only the low-hanging fruits, but also what design changes may give you more benefits uh, to use additive manufacturing. And that's where um, combination between parts, parts that can be made without some of the inner parts, parts that might have a chance to change their geometry to fit additive manufacturing, that's where more sexy uh, parts comes into the the table, and and I think that uh, um, it's it's a good way to to start navigating through additives. Start with the low hanging fruits, then go to parts consolidation, weight reduction, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Gotcha. Right. Well, let's um let's move on to the next um, topic. We will come back to the questions which we haven't uh, addressed in the Q and A. So do keep on asking those, and we will come back to you. Uh, next topic is. The decision tool method um so the traditional method versus use um additive so i'm interested um what am solutions did um did dan floss explore please uh, what am solutions or what selection solutions this the selection solutions i believe we're talking about here yes yeah what i don't want to do over here is is discuss uh, the whole spectrum of potential competitors uh, that caster has in the market uh, but uh, what i am prepared to say uh, is that we've looked we looked at everything that was available on the market and we've been doing this for a few years and we couldn't find anything uh, suitable so one of our material suppliers who are an investor in Costa actually put us onto Costa. We ran a trial and uh, we found the software for our purposes to be uh, perfectly suitable. Not least because um, there is also a connection between what OMIS, or not, not in every case, but in many cases, there's a connection between what OMIS said a moment ago, the low hanging fruits and the sexy parts that you were asking about because what we found 
I mentioned a little, a little earlier that we manufacture uh, around 25 end components additively now. But the interesting thing is some of those, most of those were low hanging fruit. Uh, but the guys in the business units who have gone through that journey with us, with the AM team, are now starting to come up with ideas to sex up their low hanging fruit parts mm -hmm. because they've realized that a lot of the design constraints that they had when they were seeing seeing the parts have gone away and that they no, no longer need to need to worry about them so some light bulb moments where you're really seeing am starting to spread through the organization absolutely and we had to take some of those those people and and some of those parts literally through a process of printing the part as is often referred to earlier in today's um, webinar uh, and in step two making some minor changes um, keeping the, the the part owner if you like on board all the time and then step three going to let's call it the sexiest version that we as the AM team can come up with but remember that the guys the the, the, the owner of those parts they know the application a lot more deeply than we do. And we found subsequently they came back and they said, hey, we have cable channels in this thing, uh, which have always had a specific shape related, which were related to the manufacturing methodology. But it wasn't the ideal shape for how we wanted our cable channels to run. We can now do what we like. We can run them where we like. It makes no difference to mm -hmm. the cost. So those kind of processes. Okay, well, here's, let me ask you this. Um, when I say, how can companies increase their confidence in uh, additive manufacturing parts? Well, the, um, at the risk of repeating myself, the the training, the training, and the training, uh, I'm going to keep repeating. Mm. But I think the industry, the additive manufacturing industry, needs to step up their game as well. Uh, in quality consistency, uh, in cost reduction, which we've mentioned earlier already, so particularly as regards process speed and the materials. And then we need to increase the industry, the additive manufacturing industry also needs to uh, increase the material diversity and how those uh, materials are handled and tested. So we very often we will we will look for a material for a component that we previously manufactured conventionally, and we may come up with a material, but nobody's done extended shelf life tests on it yet to, to test longevity. And I mentioned earlier on the length that our pr product life cycles can can have to withstand sometimes. So it's very interest. It's very important for us to know that what we build today uh, would, in a I don't know, a heating system or a cooling system or some caterpillar grader, um, still be around in twenty years' time. And, and Omar, is this something Castor helps with? Um, how can how do you see companies increasing their confidence? Yeah, I, I, I can add to that on the technical aspects of things that, that software can help you with. Um, I think that one of the biggest challenges is to help uh, engineers to identify whether the part is strong enough. I mean, mm -hmm. what's the likelihood to failure of the part? And there is a, a, a lot of uh, mystery or, or a lot of um, uncertainty whether a part will fail or not we're doing finite elements analysis for anisotropic materials for materials that are specifically um being manufactured in additive manufacture which means materials that are that have different mechanical properties in the different accesses of the part itself that's that's kind of a simulation a short 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 and easy simulation that we're doing to see only for strengths only for the maximum um, uh, stress allowed to uh, to apply on a part versus the the uh, limitation that the printer OEM uh, states for their material. So I'm going to show it for those who will keep in, keep meeting us in the networking uh, rooms after the the discussion. We're going to show 
how are we going to do the, the stress analysis okay stay Thanks. with us brilliant i do see a lot of yeah. people are keen to get to those demos so um let's uh, right. let's let's get through this part uh, first and then we'll get onto those demos straight away but um let's um let's talk about another dimension here we've been talking about sort of improving the um you know the functionality um the parts themselves but how can companies measure the financial implications of using am rather than um say their traditional methods well, no, what how would you think um how would you go about that please well, the cost aspects, uh, identifying those po those parts where you can simply uh, save costs, of, uh, we've obviously covered already a number of times here, so I won't repeat those. Mm. But I think what's very important as well, um, alongside um, I just identifying parts, particularly for new designs and, and, and new components, new products, is that we need to start thinking uh, around uh, not only parts, but business models um, that relate to those parts and methods of using additive manufacturing. So Irma's referred in, in some of his narrative earlier on to the combining of parts. Um, that's obviously something which additive is, is eminently suitable for. Um, but the if you think that to its logical end conclusion, that means that there are likely to be existing links in the value chain that are going to disappear. And I think we need to rethink uh, the business models, the go-to-market models in that context, and rethink the supply chain uh, as a consequence. I mean, everybody here, maybe not everybody here, but many people um, are aware that the logistics industry is seriously looking at a distributed spare parts model where instead of um, shipping spare parts from the factory of Danfoss, let's say, to some warehouse, keeping it there, etc., they'll be printed on demand locally. Now, there are lots of barriers to that, uh, but in principle, that's an example of rethinking a business model uh, using additive. Mm, and I think um, the events over the past uh, 15, 16 months have really thrown that into sharp relief in terms of supply chains. Um, but Omer, perhaps um, you could tell us a bit about um, how how people can use Castle to uh, to show financial implications. Yeah, and it is a good opportunity to share the screen again with, mm. with maybe with an example from the software. When we're looking on the economics uh, pair on on, on, a, on an analysis whether it has to be cheaper than the traditional manufacturing way the way we look at it is in the same um, a graph that a lot of us are aware of which is to identify the break even point versus the traditional manufacturing method in the light of the quantity of how many parts do i want to produce so what we're doing in the software is calculating estimating the the for in this in a plastic case we're estimating the injection molding cost the 3d printing cost and try to find the intersection between them so in this case uh, it makes sense to use additive manufacturing up to 250 units but and if i want to produce only 10 units then for me uh, 3d printing is a cost saving opportunity and if i want to to do more than 250 parts in a batch, then maybe I should consider 3D print and uh, injection molding all the way from the beginning. So when it comes to a pair part analysis, it's always good to compare the the alternatives. That, that's, I think, the right way to look at it. Okay. Okay. Excellent. So um, got a bit, a bit of a glimpse of the software there, but um, how is um, how is the Castle software evolving? Um, we are going to show that too on the uh, networking uh, tables after this session. Um, generally speaking, we're uh, increasing our connectivity uh, method, mm -hmm. which means that we are connected to PLM systems uh, and those those areas, and we are uh, improving the connectivity to software that are downstream to Castor. We have few. Um, uh, publications we've done around that lately. Uh, we are very focusing on improving uh, um, the identification of metal parts. We all know that metals 
are more complicated to, to it's more complicated to create an algorithm that identifies right parts for metals mm. than for plastics and, and, and we're improving that. For example, an algorithm that creates, uh, that calculates whether the part can be machined after it's being printed in 3D printing, okay? Whether a CNC can, a CNC machine can actually machine the part after it's being manufactured in 3D printing. That's a, a unique algorithm that we have. Uh, in that aspect, and, and um, yeah, maybe we should do another webinar in a, in a year from now that we can show those. Uh, those uh, well, hope, the, the hopefully progress. we can see you at a trade show at some point. That would be great. Well, uh, maybe, maybe we maybe we can meet for real. Yeah. Even better. Let's um, take right. a few more questions from the audience, and then we'll get on to the next part of the event. So, um, here's one which is very popular. Um, do you analyze parts that do not have 3D models, but only PDFs or 2D drawings? Um, we're improving in that area, but we are big believers in a CAD file, uh, although we know that not all manufacturers own the CAD file, um, mm -hmm. just because it makes the ease of the input is easier to, to provide, okay, just the CAD file, we can extract the original traditional manufacturing material, for, for example, from there, we know how the the geometry behaves, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and the output is is in a higher quality. I mean, the the analysis whether mm. a part is suitable for additive or not based on a CAD file is uh, in in a higher quality than uh, based on a PDF file. Uh, mm. But we are improving the the methods in in that area. That that's a good question. Okay, I know it's a challenge. I can imagine. Um, here's another one. Um, I understand. That the software allows to assess if parts are feasible for AM. However, AM is a very broad terminology. It's a feasibility assessment done per technology. Yeah, the, the, the way it works is that we're first identifying the right material, which means there is a material out there in 3D printing that can address the requirements of the original traditional manufacturing material. Then there is a printer that can print this material and we're on that configuration of printer and material. We're checking the geometry of the parts to see if it stands in the limitation of the specific uh, printer. Okay. Okay. Um, another one here. Um, for smaller companies that don't have an ERP or PLM system um, or a home baked system, um, how do they input parts into Castor? It's, it's a simple upload page that takes about 30 seconds. You can drag and drop a single assembly file that contains the whole assembly in a step file, SOLIDWORKS assembly, PRT from Siemens, et cetera, et cetera, or you can just uh, upload individual parts in, in a drag and drop. Uh, we're sometimes uh, also asking for the original traditional manufacturing materials in a list. It can be in an Excel sheet or as a default material, but the upload is really, it doesn't have to be from a PLM. It's, it can be uh, an upload, an active upload uh, that we take after that automatically. Okay. Um, I'm not quite sure what Vinay is driving out with this question, but um, I'll ask it. And if it makes sense, then great. Um, if not, Vinay, perhaps you could um, sort of re-ask the question if I do get this wrong. But Vinay is asking, um, how do we analyze the CAD model for AM for beginner and experts? What are the thrust areas of analysis for FDM and metal AM for CAD files? So I think the question is asking, what are the most important aspects to analyze, um, if I understand the question correctly? So, um, as, as I've mentioned, the, the uh, Castor software is based on, on four pillars, materials, geometry, the financial aspects, and the likelihood of failure, the stress analysis. If I, I think the question relates to geometry aspects, and, and in that aspect, I want to emphasize uh, one of the limitations of 3D printing, for example, is, is thin walls analysis, okay? 3D printing has some limitations when it comes mm -hmm. to minimum thin walls, and and the dry thin walls analysis being done out there are sometimes not enough. What we do in Castor is actually checking the aspect ratio of every small feature within the part. It means the ratio between the length and the width and the height of the feature in relating to the major area of the of the part. Okay. So for every feature, we check whether it's dangerous or not for additive. And that's, I would say, it's hard to guess what's the right 
aspect ratio of a printer and we do that with an algorithm that's that's a good that's good. a good uh question good but if um that's not answered your question come and find us in the networking and we'll get you the answer you're looking for no doubt um another question here so how are costs and lead times computed on the economic analysis tab that you showed do these come from actual suppliers or are they estimations um that, that's a good question caster is doing cost estimation not the price estimation which means that if you need a price you should get it from a service bureau we do help companies to get to the service bureau you can ask for a quote we work with service bureaus that provides quotes uh, we're not a marketplace but we are helping to get an end-to-end -end, um, um, answer by getting a quote from a service bureau so it is a cost estimation of caster it's all customized which means that you can change almost all every parameter in this equation of cost estimation and to customize it for your own needs if you have a printer or you want to consider a print in, in service bureau um and um but it's based on, on thirty thousand parts we've analyzed in the last uh year so we do have a mileage in, yes. in getting the right cost estimation and i imagine that only grows um with precision as the more parts you analyze that, that, yeah. that's very true that has to do with machine learning and uh the ability of software to improve itself um okay so what are the current limitations um in terms of 3d printing um regarding suitable parts um, when, when it comes to materials so so obviously mm. materials that cannot address the materials uh properties are obviously um a barrier and we check that we even check whether a material plus post process is heat treatment for example is suitable to address the original uh need but it is a barrier then when it comes to geometry we've touched uh, a minimum wall thickness but there are also tolerances manufacturing tolerances that the, the machine is just not accurate enough to do it the way the traditional manufacturing way is doing it minimum hole size the CAD file itself maybe is not suitable to be transformed to an SDL to a file that a printer can actually print. So a lot of things can happen there. Um, a lot of things that you need to take into consideration, I would say. Yeah, it's okay. not an easy test. Um, one of the things um, that you probably do definitely take into consideration, um, somebody's asking, what Andreas is asking, complex lattices are not VREP geometry. They are voxel or implicit uh, geometry. Can you read these types? I'll answer more generally. Um, we are not, we're analyzing the volume as a volume, which means that we're not doing slicing uh, when we need to analyze a part. We do take uh, native CAD as input. Mm -hmm. uh, we know how to handle them. Okay, we do use BREP to, rep to represent the geometry. We even do the conversion to an STL just to check if the conversion will, will work or not. Uh, and, and, and we do support native CAD from, from Creo. Um, I think to be more specific than that, it will just uh, be very specific. We can okay. take it to the to the network. Uh, yeah, definitely come and uh, come and talk more about this in the networking session. Um, another question: Does Castle Software have FEA capability? If so, does it include nonlinear analysis capabilities? Mm -hmm. No, we do that. We do have uh, FEA analysis. It's only in the linear uh, area of additive manufacturing. It's in the linear area, but for anisotropic material that is being used in, in 3D printing. So we do take the Z adhesion limitation when it comes to calculate the FNA analysis. And, and and I, again, I welcome you to to uh, visit us in the in the networking event and I can show you how quickly we're doing FEA. It's not, a, it's a three clicks of a button that we managed to create FEA analysis specifically for 3D printing. Okay, um, one last question and I think, um, how does um, Castor account for the labor aspect of post-processing when outputting a final part? So there are a few options to include the cost estimation that involves in post-processing of a part. Either uh, the part has a, a very high demanding manufacturing tolerances that just require to add extra machining to the uh, cost estimation. We do that automatically or either manually uh, an expert can choose polishing, painting, 
uh, extra heat treatment, extra machining in the software, and to add that to the cost estimation. Uh, we, we're not the, the doctors. We give tools to the doctors to take better decisions, okay? So if you know you need a post-process, we have a tool to give you to estimate that. I like that analogy. Volume will play a role there as well. As more and more parts get analyzed, that'll become better and better. Mm. That's right. Um, look, I know people are itching to see the demos, so I think let's move to the networking session. Um, just quickly, I'd like to thank you both, Omar Blair, co-founder and CEO of Castor, and Werner Stapler, the global head of additive uh, design and manufacturing, Dan Foss, for your insights. Um, we'll be in the networking session now, so everyone's also going to have to join that. Please come and find the areas you're interested in. You'll see the tables are labeled for demos, uh, for networking. Uh, for the general meetings with the team. There are many representatives of Castor um, who are going to be in the networking, so we'll be very happy to answer your questions. Um, okay, so gentlemen, thank you for your time today. Thank Thanks, you, Michael. Thanks, Omar. See you in the networking. See you in the networking.